All right. Um, I want everybody to uh, pick a partner. Just pick somebody near you, and I want you to face them. I know you're, it's, it's like awkward eye contact. Yes, please. This is an interactive time for a second here. Face them, and what I want you to do is in just a second, I want you to get ready to look at that person's face and tell them what you think is their best facial feature. Do not tell them yet. Shh, shh, shh. Don't tell them yet. I want you to wait a second. And, and, and when I say, go ahead and tell them, ready, set, go. You might have seen some eyes that you liked. Maybe a nose. Maybe you saw some earlobes that looked really good. Okay, 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 okay. You guys must have had really nice faces. This is good. You, you, you saw all kinds of things. Hopefully you weren't talking about anything below the neck. We were just focused on the face in here. I think one of the things that you just did, I mean, what did you do? You looked at the face and you saw that person's face, but eventually you zoomed in and focused on one thing, right? You saw something specific and you were like, okay, that thing right there is what I like. And if there's anything that I want to leave you here with tonight, it's that focus frames the future. Focus frames not only your future, but everybody's future in here. It's just how we work. We have this internal lens that's like our perspective. And, and for me, I can tell you, I've been a commercial and editorial photographer for the last 12 years. And so communicating visually is what I do. That's what I do every day. And the interesting thing is there's no two perspectives in here that are the same. Physically where you're sitting, but also personally. It, it's, your, it's your personal background. So if I were to give you my personal lens, my personal background, you'd need to know my mother. She's black and Jewish. And then my father is, is black, and he has some Native American heritage as well. Uh, but then my grandfather before him, he's from a, a place called Cotton Plant, Mississippi, which is a real place. He was a farmer there in Cotton Plant, Mississippi. I, I don't think I need to tell you what he farmed. <laughs> but that's where he was from. So to even, even complicate things more, I then got married uh, to this beautiful woman right here um, and about a year and almost two years ago. Uh, we got married, and she's Mexican and Irish. So one day when we have kids, we're just going to tell them, you're brown. And that's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. You're just, let's just keep it going. So I can think of uh, a lot of my, my formative years were actually spent here in Naperville. And the reason why is because my parents met a couple blocks down the road at the cafeteria here on North Central College's campus. I know, it's crazy. I'm like, my life is here because of North Central. Thank you. So it's crazy, it's crazy to think about, like, my, my, my formative years being spent here, going, going to school in Naperville, but then at the same time, my family, by way of the Great Migration in the 40s and 50s, made their way to the south parts of Chicago. And I think about that because I would actually move during the week, I'd be in Naperville, which is one of the safest places in America, by the way, and then I'd be on the south side of Chicago, which is known as one of the more dangerous places in America. And in between these two places, I realized that I, I, I basically grew up in two cultures. And I was never black enough, and I was never white enough. I was never uh, suburban or urban enough. And I think about that, and I remember my friends like here in Naperville, when I'd be hanging out, they'd be like, yes, we finally have a black friend. And then, and then when they found out that I couldn't rap or that I didn't, like, wear, like, FUBU or other urban clothing, they were, like, confused and, like, disappointed. They were like, why can't you flow? And then <laughs> over here, I'd be on the south side with my cousins and all my family, and they'd be like, why do you talk like that? Or they'd be like, why are your pants so tight? And I'd be like, I don't know why my pants are so tight. <laughs> but that was, that was just the reality I lived in, and I didn't... 
at the time, it was really difficult for me. I, I, did, I really didn't enjoy that. I wanted to fit in in both places. But over time, I started to realize that this multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-everything thing was a gift for me. And that gift was perspective. That gift was a way to see people in the city and people in the suburbs. Did you know that, oh, I forgot to show you. There I am when I was little. I know. <laughs> So crazy. What happened to me? So I just think about I just think about growing up and then getting to this point where I'm using my perspective. And so in our perspective, we actually we actually find ourselves needing to communicate that perspective. And we've gone throughout history primarily communicating our perspective verbally or maybe through the written word. But now we we've just started and are living through a, a, a digital revolution in which most of what we communicate is visual. 1.8 billion images a day we upload and share. Every day. I know, it's crazy. Six to eight hours a day, folks, we're spending consuming images. That's like half a day. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. And so I, I think about that, and then I think about the fact that I have like 16,000, I checked the other day, 16,000 photos on my phone. And a lot of times they're photos that, like, you know that feeling that when you're taking a picture, you feel like you're, like, creating art. Or you're like, this is a moment in history and everyone will thank me for it. But then it's just a piece of cheesecake and you didn't realize <laughs> that no one was really going to care about that. But I think some of the photos aren't so pointless. Some of the photos actually are of people that matter to us a lot. Some of the photos are of moments that really matter to us a lot. And so I think ultimately we have to acknowledge the fact that these, that these photos say something to us. Even if they're in ordinary places, they say something to us about what attracts our focus. What, what exactly is attracting what we care about? And that focus actually winds up impacting our lives in the future and impacting the lives of those we love in the future, too. I can remember being 15 years old. I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and dyslexia, double whammy, and I had to take Ritalin. And it was really frustrating for me because I, was, I, I wasn't a very good student. Couldn't fo I was either focused on the wrong thing or focused on too many things. And then I remember about five years later, my youth pastor at the time, Steve, he invited me to go on this, this uh, spring break missions trip to El Salvador, and I agreed. And my job on that trip was to document the trip and help us remember what happened. Wasn't a photographer. They were just like, here's a camera. Make sure you don't screw it up. And so I, for the next two weeks, I'm just looking through a lens. The next two weeks, I just start to see people, and I start to see things, and I start to see life and the world in a way that I had never quite seen it before. And it was something that just started to come alive for me. Archbishop Timothy Dolan said, we hold in our heart the spark of the divine, and it was that spark that I started to see in people's lives I started to see something that wasn't just a normal person walking by, but there was something divine in there too, and I was catching it with my eye. The discipline of focus started to become the framework for my calling. This focus thing started to be a vehicle that drove me past ADD and past dyslexia, and then all of a sudden I found myself actually standing on the steps of my calling. People eventually started letting me take portraits of them here and there. And then after that, I started to get a few publications and a few uh, just local editorial jobs here and there. And then before I knew it, um, I found that I always thought that lady looked like a DJ. Um, <laughs> before I knew it, it was like my, my life was starting to be taken along this ride by the focus that had happened. She could see herself in the lens, and so that's why she made that face. But all of a sudden, photography started to take me all over the world. And it wasn't because there was anything so special about me. It was because 
this focused thing started to literally frame my future. I went from doing small publications to eventually doing uh, larger uh, national campaigns. And then at some point I was doing, um, I was doing global campaigns as well. And it was crazy because I went from this kid who needed to be medicated for his inability to focus to this guy who, this photographer who all of a sudden had photos up in Times Square. And a lot of people stop at focus uh, on their own self. And I think that that's, that's where we trip up because I think it's most important for our focus to get to the point where we start to look beyond ourselves and into the lives of others. I'll give you an example. There's a lady named Sally Hazelgrove on the south side of Chicago who has started a youth program who teaches boys 8 to 18 boxing. And as they're learning boxing, they learn discipline and they learn life lessons and, and, and how to get along with one another. But this program actually has a 90% success rate at kids who've had a criminal background that helping them get, never, never be arrested again. Just because of the, of the way that they can come to a place like this and all of a sudden belong and all of a sudden realize that they have a connection. And this wouldn't be possible unless somebody invited them into something more than an after school program, but instead a space where focus could start to frame their future. I think about this and I always remember this quote Bill Withers said, Men crave dignity like water. And in this space, you see. Boys being dignified, being made worth something. I always think of my grandmother uh, when I was eight years old, God rest her soul. I remember she, she told me, uh, I can't wait to be at your college graduation. And then I remember when I was in high school and struggling with my disability, she actually said, I can't wait to be at your college graduation. And then again, when I was a sophomore in college here, about to fail out of some of my classes and wanted to drop out, I remember her telling me, I can't wait to be at your college graduation. Do you know when this woman was 93, she could barely walk, talk, or see? On a hot day in July, there was my grandmother in the first row at my college graduation. Her focus literally framed my future. It literally brought something out of me. And I think of this, if, you, if, we're, if we're talking about what's the secret to live a good life, what's the secret to live a full life, I think part of it is acknowledging the fact that we have a finite number of opportunities to serve and love people and call out that focus. And I'll end with this. I just think of, um, there's, there's, there's lion tamers um, that use a stool and they do this um, because they don't want to have to just go into the, the, the lion cage, but instead they use a stool because the lion actually starts to focus on the four legs of the stool. And as the lion's focusing on these four legs, all of a sudden its focus becomes fragmented, its attention starts to go all over the place. They have a whip and they have a gun, but the best tool that they have is their stool. And this lion that is strong and, and capable all of a sudden goes from uh, being a mighty animal to uh, being paralyzed. And I just wonder, do we have anybody who's like a lion who's being tamed in here today? Do we have anybody who, from that 1.8 billion images has found themselves paralyzed, who otherwise would be mighty, otherwise would be strong, otherwise would be powerful, otherwise would have something to say to somebody to focus their life, but instead has been drowned out. You live among communities, cities, and most importantly, people that don't know their purpose. And I think part of our job, just like we did earlier today, is to look somebody in the eye and decide to focus and call out their future. Thank you. <clears throat>